Welcome back to Tennis Unfiltered with me, James Gray of the iNewspaper and iNews.co.uk. This is the podcast where we don't hold back. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. Yes, I'm James Gray. I've got Calvin Bett on our resident tennis coach here, and I've also got George Belshaw, our resident tennis writer. I don't know why I always say resident. Neither of them live with me, but um, chance would be a fine thing. What a what a flat that would be, Calvin. Eh? I I can only imagine what the three of us would get up to. Yeah, George is also not a tennis writer, is he anymore? <laughs> I mean, he still occasionally <laughs> writes about tennis, doesn't he? George, do you want yeah, to defend your defend your career choice? Yeah, I've uh, I've written some things about tennis. How, how how recently do you need to write something to be considered a tennis writer? I could say something very rude about a lot of members of the tennis writing community, and I'm not going to. <laughs> um, yeah, probably more recently than so. Yeah, exactly. Uh, George, we should apologise on George's behalf that he hasn't got his microphone because he is in limbo and therefore you packed stuff all over the place, George, as far as I can tell. Yeah, I don't know where I've put it, and I'm trying not to be annoyed at my... So I've, I'm hoping I've not dropped it somewhere on route and need to get a new microphone, but oh, great. I can't the old, imagine where I'd have put it. The old tennis unfiltered expenses account gets another rattling from Belshaw. What a surprise. Uh, Calvin, you're, you're gearing up for a late night, are you? Uh, yes, uh, Henry and Julian, who I coach, um, are playing around about, I reckon, probably 11.30 tonight in Houston. It's not so, it could be worse. I mean, I, there, there are later later nights. Uh, so they're obviously moving on to the clay now, because that's the US Clay Court Championships, or whatever they call themselves. Uh, I had a question that I almost asked you off air, and I've saved it for on air. How... How much does clay actually change doubles? Does it change it? It doesn't change as much as it changes singles, presumably. Uh, no, not as much as singles, but it, it is. It does change it. Uh, there are certain things that are different. Um, there are, you know, I think there are pairs who are better clay court players, um, especially now with about fifty percent of the top one hundred serving and staying back in doubles. Um, mm. A lot of those players do favour clay courts um you know i think sort of pairs like um the colombian lads farrer and cabral um they would i would say they were a clay court pair although they both serve volley to be fair but their their results have been best in the french um in the slams and um yeah and also like little things like if you serve you know if you like for the like both henry and jules they serve volley on both serves and little things like as the server's partner, the movements, the initial movements, obviously the clay's a little bit more unstable. There's there's more um, scope for slipping and that kind of thing. Um, mm. But yeah, I mean, Henry and Jules have uh, only played one clay court tournament and won it. So um, <laughs> I guess they're a clay court doubles. But, uh, <laughs> 100% record. Where was that? I can't remember now. It was in Portugal at the end of last year. They needed to win the last two tournaments of the year to qualify for the Aussie Open and then they won in Italy when I were with them indoor hard and then when they str- then when they went straight to uh, clay in Portugal and won there very good well defending a defending an unbeaten record then in uh, Houston this week George have you made the transition onto the clay yet or are you uh, sticking to limping around on AstroTurf <laughs> I've not actually played uh, the last last two weeks I played a kind of friendly doubles game when I was incredibly hungover about two weekends ago and we booked in for two hours and the first hour I played quite well and then I was just like absolutely dying and I've, I've not gone back since <laughs> I need to uh, get myself uh, more energetically motivated next time I'm on the court and being the athlete I aspire to be rather than the uh, reprobate I am <laughs> Very good, dude. Um, on that uh, bright note, I should ask you all to vote for us in the Sports Podcast Awards. We've been nominated for Best Tennis Podcast. Um, if you Google Sports Podcast Awards, then you will find the website. I will also put the link in the show notes. Public voting closes on April the 6th. Now, that is three days away as I record. It may only be a day or two away as you listen, so please do it now. I'll give you the opportunity to hit pause. You can pause for as long as you want 
go and vote for us. Uh, we we don't get nominated for many awards uh, because sometimes you have to pay to enter them. We're tight. But um, <laughs> frankly, we would really like to win this one. And I know some of the other podcasts are very motivated about getting people to vote for them. And we've been a little bit lackluster, maybe because we're embarrassed. So um, if you like our podcast, or even if you don't, actually, I don't care why you vote for us. Just please vote for us in the Sports Podcast Awards in the tennis category. Um, if you can't do that or don't want to or whatever, please do leave us a rating or a review wherever you get your podcast because that, well, that's just nice, actually. It doesn't improve discoverability, I found out the other day, but it does make us feel good, so please do do it. Um, you can also get involved with the podcast. I, I always say if you leave us a five-star review, I will read it out on the podcast. But if you want to go further and have a real question for the pod, then you can do that as well. You can get in touch on Twitter. It's at Unfilter Tennis. Uh, or you can drop us an email, which is tennisunfiltered at gmail.com, which is what quite a few of you have done this week. And that's what we're going to start with today. We're going to go through a couple of listener questions um, and just chat about the random topics that have occurred to you. And you've gone, oh, I wonder what George and Calvin know about this. Or more often than not, Calvin. Uh, we've had an email from the south of France, Vince in Montpellier. Uh, I'm very jealous already because I wish I was in Montpellier almost all of the time. Uh, he says, I'm a long time listener. I was thinking about reading this in a French accent, and I'm still not against it, but Vince may also not be French. So he's a long time listener of the podcast, and he. I had a question I'd be happy to hear discussed if you find it interesting. I noticed Manorino and Ostapenko don't play with any brands visible on their outfits. Do you know why or how rare it is for players not to have sponsored kits? Personally, I've always wondered why successful players would tie themselves to a sponsor that might add pressure on performance and find it refreshing not to look at logos during a match. Uh, thank you for all your great work, Vince. Uh, Calvin, who's your clothing sponsor? Uh, Mike. <laughs> I don't know if he's a sponsor, but I get uh, a less send me a, a box of kit about, about three times a year. So um, <laughs> I must obviously but... uh, be a big influencer in the tennis world. Um, <laughs> but uh, you don't get finance on top of that, presumably. No, no, I, I do not. No, no, I do not, no. Um, at, what, at what point does sort of those clothing deals kick in for a player? I mean, you know, with cash involved as well, I wonder. Um, the issue is, I'll answer the question as to why they don't have a sponsor, is that there's there's not loads of money in tennis outside of the very top hmm. in terms of who would you be selling who are, are the if if people see the brand on a player are they selling kit i remember not long ago somebody from a less was asking me about potentially doing a deal for a player it's not fair for me to name names but they had another player who, who had just left the company um who was relatively you know he's, he was at the time he's a top 30 player um and he and the guy who was the rep asked me do you think we should give a deal and money to this player um and and I we were sort of umming and ahhing it and he said do you think he'd sell more shirts than player X meaning the player who just left the company and I said well how many shirts did he sell you and he said well hardly any so mm. and that was a guy ranked twenty five in the world at the time I think so the players uh, the tennis players and I know this because I know a few people who work in agents and agency and who also work for the clothing brands tennis players unless you're getting real extensive coverage at the back end of the big tournaments, they're not getting great deals on clothing. So what you do, what you're tending to see now is a lot of smaller brands giving deals to the players who are ranked sort of 100 to even 10, you know, even, you know, like Rublev's got a, a smaller brand now giving him a deal and, and that kind of thing. And I think you're seeing a lot more of that, but the big companies, they just don't see value in giving money to tennis players to wear their kit now most of the companies will give kit but i assume that players such as ostapenko manorino they probably don't want to tie themselves down with a, a kit only deal in case there is something that may come along with some sort of finance added but if we're talking about finance added you're looking at i'd say probably ten thousand dollars max for a player of that level I mean, I, I I would wish to cast no real aspersions against Yelena Ostapenko because I really like her and she really makes me laugh. But she does enough wear some weird clobber. Like, honestly, yeah. some of the gear she comes out in. I think she needs a clothing sponsor just to be like, Yelena, this is what you have to wear because it's sensible. But I don't know, may, maybe a clothing sponsor who's got a really wacky kind of brand would look at that and go, yeah, great, I'm, I'm not really sure. 
The game's changed quite a bit in the clothing area, though, in the last 20 years, I'd say, because what, what tended to happen is the, the big names, Agassi, Sampras, Edberg, back in the day, you'd only have really one or two kit rotations in the year. And I can tell you now, obviously, we discussed recently, I was a big Agassi fan, and Agassi's clothing was a big, big element of him. And I can tell you, if I see a picture of Agassi, I can tell you now which year it was. It was that bigger thing with him. He had a different different line. Whereas now, so so people went and bought the specifically the line every year. And there's still people now on, on Instagram. I follow a few people who just basically seem to just collect old Agassi gear from each year. Whereas <laughs> now, like Nike, who are the same company, will churn out probably five, six, seven kit drops a year and changes of kit. So there's no there's no time really for that any of that kit to become iconic. In, in what in in the way that the the old the kit did back in the day so now what they're basically doing and i know this from the company that i get some kit from unless that they're basically all they're looking for is just for people to see the brand they don't even care really if they go and buy specifically that tennis shirt that the player has on it's just it's just brand advertisement they see the badge and i think nike are the same like you know i mean you know who's um i guess alcaraz now Alcaraz will wear eight different kits this year, I reckon, mm. or kit designs. Yeah, at least. Yeah. So it's and not I like suppose... anybody's going, like, back, your parents can't go and buy their kids eight different Alcaraz kits like they would have 15, 20 years ago. Mm. Um, I was thinking about that on the Nike kind of theme for all the Nike kits at the US Open. You know, Francis Tiafo wearing that incredibly jazzy sort of singlet. Yeah. I don't, th- you know, I think that probably did more for general brand awareness of Nike kit than it did for actually selling that singlet. Yeah, but if I'll yeah. just come in, George. I know you want to speak. If if say that if TFO would wear have worn that kit all year though, James, then it would become like, like an iconic kit like yeah. that. That's what I'm trying to say. Whereas whereas okay. what what happens is I don't think he's even wearing it now. We're only like no. in March. I think he's moved on from it. So. It it's it never gets the time to be seen as an iconic kit, so it is just brand awareness. Yeah, you of course get the the knock on effect is that quite often players have the same kits as well, which is an absolute nightmare yeah. to watch matches as well. I, I mean that is say, so I was gonna stupid. Just say some credit to I think it was Nike this this week in Miami where they were making sure that people seemed to be wearing different kits. Which I thought was absolutely like clutch, but yes, it, 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 George, I, I seem to remember basically Holger Rune and Jack Draper, apart from being very different sizes, both wear backwards caps and are both sponsored by Nike, and both seem to have the same color palette from Nike, and to to the untrained eye, are completely indecipherable. I think what my favorite one was the match of the zebras, which was Team and Zverev, I think, at the French Open. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they yeah. both have this distinct black horrible. and white stripe. What always tended to happen up until a couple of years ago was that with Nike in particular was that Nadal would have his own range and nobody else wore it. Federer would have his own range and nobody else wore it. And then there'd be a different range for all the other players that they all wore. What it seems to have gone, I'm not certain about this. It seems to have gone now that they're just a load. Nobody really has their own range. It's like they've gone quite plain, I guess, at the Miami and um, Indian Wells. So it's now just seems to be a collection of about eight different tops and four different pairs of shorts and the players just mix and match whichever ones between mm. them. I imagine yeah, that, that Alcaraz will get his own range. That seems to be, yeah, a sort of, and there's a palette and a, a general look and feel to yeah. use terminology that branding people like. Just, just returning to the two players mentioned in the example, I mean, in the question, Manorino's iconic look, I think, is where he wears those skulls on him, isn't it? That's kind of... I don't know if that was a sponsor. He just bought his own. No, that brand. was sponsored. That was a de- that was a uh, company. I think they were called. They were either called Hy. Well, there's two different ones with skills. There's one called Hydrogen, and there's one called Buddy Badu or something like that. Yeah, that's uh, Liam Brody's got a deal with them. Yeah, yeah, I think, yeah. yeah. I think that's right. But I think um, I think Manorino's deal with them may have been up, and he's now just wearing unbranded wearing gear. Nothing, yeah. yeah, I think <laughs> I... though. Go on, sorry, James. No, I'm trying to remember the name of the brand that I associate Adrian Manorino with, but I can't. It's not. He has worn Lacoste, I think, but uh, he's worn Nike gonna... as well. I've just looked at a couple of pictures. Adrian of Manorino, Manorino a, re- a real branding whore. What what, what tends to happen is that the players who are particularly good juniors, Nike or Adidas, will snap them up when they're young. 
and they'll get them on relatively long deals. So if they're sort of 16, they'll stick them on an eight-year deal. And then if mm. they develop as players as they want, they'll stay on that deal. Whereas if if it if they don't progress, and I'm saying don't progress in terms of what Nike want, which is basically top 10 players, the deal will be up. And then that's why you get situation. Now, the big one, the, the, the main one really where Nike, I'm surprised they didn't renew the contract was Felix Oger Aliassim. Um, a couple of years ago when there was we went through the pandemic thing they said they were cutting costs and what have you but he's um you know he's a potential superstar that they let walk away they just didn't offer him a renewal the one that came up during the french open last year was leolia jean jean who was a, a child prodigy tennis player and she was given a 10-year deal at the age of 13 um and then had a massive injury and she did eventually win a couple of main draw matches and she's kind of on the way back um on a separate note calvin i've just sent you a picture of uh, some trainers uh, yeah. posted by andre agassi on twitter when it which when it comes to calvin betton's interests feels like right in the middle of the venn diagram what are your feelings on the trainers well those trainers are actually uh, nike have done a couple of these where the, those are the the sort of the i don't know if they're remake you would say or they've got hints of the first I think actually it was the second Agassi shoe. It's called Hot Lava. It was the Air Tech Challenge 2. Um, and um, so the new, or I, I think they're actually a couple of years old, those ones that Agassi's got on in that one. But they basically sort of gave, um, I don't know what the word would be, be influenced by the original Agassi shoe with the pattern. Um, and they're actually, the, the, they were new tennis shoes though. So um but I think that was that was from this pickleball thing, I assume, wasn't it, that Agassi was playing in yesterday? Yes, yeah, which is potentially the only time we're going to mention it. I, I would, we are going to have to talk about pickleball at some point. I, I don't think I'm ready. Like, I, it's, I, I just. Well, I, I, I'll say something on it. I was actually, in, in order to try and forget the football as soon as possible uh, yesterday, <laughs> I, um, I was trying to catch it, and I, I was trying to find somewhere. Obviously, we don't. It was on ESPN, but. We don't have ESPN in the UK, and I couldn't really find anywhere that it was on. I couldn't find a perhaps not entirely legal stream of it um, <laughs> anywhere. But also, like their their own Instagram and sort of Twitter, they didn't have any. It was difficult to find out actually what was happening, who was winning the matches, and the yeah. scoring system just seemed all over the shop. And in the end, I just gave up because I, I mean, what look as we come back to, it kind of related to what we've been speaking about in the last couple of weeks. I was tuning in because I just wanted to see John McEnroe and Andre Agassi play whatever they're playing. And if they're going to play <laughs> some imitation of tennis, I'll watch it and people will watch it. And it's all we'll hear now about how, how good the viewing figures were on that. But let's see how good the viewing figures are if you take Andre Agassi and John McEnroe out of it. I mean, if you had Andre Agassi and John McEnroe playing dominoes, you'd get good viewing Probably. figures, right? Like, yeah. It's, 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 it's just personality driven entirely. So, yeah, I yeah. kind of agree with you there. You know, I've only really caught one or two clips from it, but you, you can tell, you know, even watching McEnroe now, he's always just so bloody competitive, isn't it? He's just ridiculous. Oh, like, and he's, he's, a ball of en- he's a ball of energy. Like, there's, like even I remember doing a round table with him in Paris last year and he just, let, he was literally, his leg was tapping and he couldn't sit still in his chair. And he honestly, it was about half 10 in the morning and he clearly hadn't slept or just got off a plane. I wasn't quite sure which. And he was just, twitching like a loop if i if i didn't know better i'd say he was on some sort of come down but i'm absolutely <laughs> sure that he wasn't um but anyway we, we've been we veered violently off topic so i'm going to drag us back on with a, a long email from lorraine on email and um, she says firstly congrats on the pod which i discovered a few months ago and look forward to each week so refreshing to hear honest opinions love it uh, following on from your discussion last time about commentators, you mentioned Nick Lester being really good. I've just watched the Miami men's final and his co-commentator Robbie Koenig just cannot stop talking pretty much after every point in between first and second serves. Occasionally still talking once the point is underway. Arg. And if you can't think of something to say about the match, he's usually talking about Tiger Woods and what Tiger Woods' dad used to do and the hot day of Wimbledon final and a tennis coach who isn't sitting there today. Where is he? Oh, he's still involved with the academy. And then it's all about she does a very good feat, <laughs> Robbie Koenig rant that I probably can't do cr- justice to. Uh, she says, I love his enthusiasm, but I'm not a big fan of comments like that's a filthy backhand, but he really needs to rein it in, in my opinion. I should say, this is not the first comment I've had about Robbie Koenig and the word filthy. I had lunch with my mother <laughs> yesterday, and she literally said to me, oh, that Alcaraz cinema, she was brilliant, but that commentator keeps calling it filthy. I hate it. Um, 
Yeah, and then she's also got some things to say about Sam Smith, who she's not super keen on. Um, I would love to hear your thoughts, and given that you are honest and unfiltered, what do you really think? Am I being unreasonable? Apart from Nick, who else do you rate as a commentator? I punch the air with joy when it's someone like Jim Courier. I mean, we did kind of, you know, cover some of this last uh, week when we were talking about co-commentators and, and pundits and the rest of it. I mean... I don't necessarily want to sit here and slag off Robbie Koenig, but I'm I'm kind of on Lorraine's team here. Like, it, I I am a big fan of what, and American listeners won't have a clue what this means, but the Test match special style of commentary, where as much as providing in depth, tight analysis on the tennis, you're also providing company and talking a bit of nonsense and uh, about random things that come into your head. But the reason it works on Test match special is because, which is a cricket radio program i should point out is because cricket lasts all day and so you really are just sit effectively and i always say with radio you're effectively sitting with someone in their living room or in their garden or whatever you really are with them all day and so you need to talk about other things and even in a five set tennis match i think that there is space for that because it can be three four five hours but you know in in a master's final where even the longer ones are only going to be maybe three hours and i that alcaraz cinema match i haven't got a match time in front of me but you know, I do think in those slightly more rarefied atmospheres, there's less room for that colour. And that, you know, some people really like Robbie Koenig. And, and I, well, I should say, when he talks about tennis, I think he's pretty good. But I do also think he gets a case of the Danny Morrisons, who's another cricket commentator. And I apologise for people to whom that means nothing. But he does get very excited and sometimes talks over the tennis. Um. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd agree with that. I do think Robbie is, is good and he's knowledgeable. There's no question. I was told, and I don't know if this is true, that he basically he he's, has a list of phrases. He he thinks up phrases <laughs> that he wants to use before he goes on and, oh, then no. play t- and then play tests them because I was told that he's really desperate to try and find himself like a c- catchphrase or something mm-hmm. like that. Now, it might be bullshit. I don't know, but uh, you do get the feeling that might be the case, as we f- we just heard that he keeps calling everything filthy. And if that is the mm-hmm. case, he'll be over the moon that people are associating that with him. I think t- t- tennis is quite a difficult sport to commentate on because, weirdly, it's the only sport, and I don't know why this is, why it may be from the days when um, th- when the commentators were sat right behind the court and there was they were open so they could hear them but it's the only sport where they don't actually commentate while the, while the actual sport is going on like yeah. they they stop talking while while the point is being played and then talk in between it but the problem is also that there's often not a lot actually going on in a tennis match to cut to talk about so you get this strange sort of staggered we're going to talk for 20 seconds and then stop talking for however long the point goes on and then start talking again, even though there might not be anything to talk about in the last point that was just played. Uh, yeah, go on, George. Yeah, I was, gonna say, I mean, I, I was going to make a, a similar point about kind of not interrupting. I'm slightly surprised no one's challenged the status quo of that on, on yeah. TV a bit and made it a bit more of a conversational thing when the tennis is happening, but they kind of keep keep talking going about it the, the other thing i'd kind of say is i think you know you know maybe maybe lorraine agrees with this it can just the commentating could be a bit more interesting if people were a little bit punchier sometimes i think you know you i do get the sense that there's sometimes a bit of holding back um in terms of what can we interestingly say about people where you know i'm no great cricket expert but I think you get a bit more, you, you feel like you're finding out a bit more about the people and who they are and people are kind of more willing to let their tongue go. Um, mm. And I, I think cricket commentating is probably a, a safer gig in some ways in terms of, you know, it, it's more kind of broadcast yeah. mainstream and, you know, a lot more interest, certainly in this country at the minute. Um, so, yeah, I, I, yeah, I think there's a few things, but I, I'm really surprised that people haven't, tried to push back on this kind of stopping thing because Calvin will be absolutely right. It will have started because, you know, there's no kind of probably good glass between the court, but that that cannot be the case now. No one's ever heard a commentator speaking during a match from the court, have they? So I think it'd be absolutely fine for them to keep whittling on in their own uh, time. 
Yeah, the only time it ever happens, and it'll never happen again because they've moved the broadcast roof, I believe, um, at Wimbledon, is is where the TV people do their live links at Wimbledon. It's on top of the roof of the broadcast centre, and it overlooks... Is it is it 17 or 18? I always forget which, which number court that is at Wimbledon that you can see from the broadcast roof. And on occasion, there have been players shouting, can you please keep it down up there? Because <laughs> someone's doing, you know, like the BBC World, BBC News at one o'clock or whatever it happens to be um, live. Uh, Lorraine also mentions Jim Courier. I, I think the reason, and he came up last week when we talked about him, I think the reason Jim Courier is so popular, and I think this is probably true of all good commentators, is he's very humble and he, he doesn't think that it's all about him and he makes it all about the players and all about the tennis and, and sometimes all about his co-commentator and I think that people find that very endearing and also, I think that's what a good referee or a good goalkeeper or a good commentator should be, is you don't notice them when they do it really well. Um, Petch is really good as well, I think. He's, yeah. he's, he's, ex- he's excellent. What what really infuriates me, this is like the thing that's coming re- come in recently, and this is all sports, but tennis commentators do it as well. It's like banter about each other's golf. Like, who, <laughs> who cares? Like, why do they always do that? And they do the football commentators do it as well, and it's like, what... Who finds this interesting? It comes back to the old thing that people are really into golf. All they want to talk about is golf. And it's yeah. just, and nobody else wants to know about anyone else's golf. <laughs> it's really boring. How is your golf game, Calvin? I mean, I'm just... on sabbatical still. Two years going there. <laughs> well done. Um, right. Another question from the emails. Uh, Nikos Biggs Kiropoulos, whose name you will have heard before. He's a very regular listener and Contributor, he says, me again with a question for the experts of this podcast. Why do American tournaments never seem to cover their courts during rain delays? The only thing more frustrating than waiting through rain is waiting another hour for them to dry the court. The method they use, leaf blowers and towels, also seems very inefficient and environmentally unfriendly. Not that tennis seems to care much about ecology. Uh, To be clear, I'm talking about tarps over the courts like we see all the time at clay and grass court tournaments since, of course, roofs are not affordable everywhere. Thanks for reading and for answering my previous questions. Oh, it's always appreciated. I love that you don't shy away from certain topics or try to be rosy all the time. You're welcome, Nikos. Calvin, you've you've spent time in the US watching the rainfall. Yeah, it's it's basically because of the climate where most of the tournaments are in, I guess, in Florida, some of them in Texas, uh, where the outdoor tournaments are and um, in the, in the American summer. When the rain does come, it tends to come in short spells in general and it's mm-hmm. usually so hot and humid that the courts dry exceptionally quick anyway so right. co- covering them wouldn't really it might save you 15 minutes but that's or all uh, yeah. But yeah and, and regardless how quickly how much it does rain it's normally so hot where wherever the outdoor tournaments are in america that it, and, and those courts tend to be they dry quick that there's no real benefit which is different from this kind of the clay courts where if it rains heavily and the weather is not that warm you're looking at another couple hours for the courts to dry and especially the grass where you've got no chance if, if any water yeah. gets on the on the grass i do um really like he points out that it, there must be a better way of doing it i love that a load of ball boys and a load of towels is still the preferred method and i also wanted to shout out jessica pagula i'm not sure which match it was during in miami but she like you know people give jessica pagula a stick because she's a billionaire and they don't think she's very real but she was out there with the ball boys and ball girls, like, you know, with her foot on a towel, dragging it up the lines and stuff. She was helping dry the court, which I kind of respected. I, I the ones, the most bizarre thing, one of the most bizarre things I've ever seen in tennis was a few years ago in um, Greece, where it was chucking it down. But while it was chucking it down, they had the tournament officials and the ball kids were drying the courts and sponging the courts. And it was still <laughs> raining. And I was thinking, oh, like, what, what, what are you doing here? It's like all sort of logic had gone out. It was, it was still raining. Also, on that, on a similar note, I once um, there's once a British tournament. This was only about three or four years ago. There's a British tournament where a player I coach were playing, and it was on grass. And the forecast was it was going to be terrible in the afternoon. I think you say it was the forecast from three o'clock onwards was it was going to be terrible. Thunderstorms, rain for ten hours on the bounce, and um, it started raining, started drizzling, and the referee still sent the players on. And I remember thinking, like, well, why are you sending the players on? You know what's coming, and it's already raining on a grass court. But some referees just will not budge. 
I see. Uh, right, I've got another question. I think this one comes from Twitter. Uh, Ian Warren, was that? Uh, does tennis lose credibility when it asks top players to start playing a match after midnight? E.g. Medvedev last week, I think, started a match at 12.30. Uh, George, I mean, you know my thoughts on this, but what do you think? I mean, at what point do you say, come back tomorrow, please? Uh, definitely before half midnight, in my opinion. I don't, I don't see who gets any benefit from that apart from maybe fans on the other side of the world who it happens to fall into their time zone if you go to tournaments any match that goes on late while you know is vaguely interesting from the fact they're playing sports or three in the morning like the fans aren't there there's no way for them to get home so they all leave for the kind of last train or to get a taxi and some of them have work the next day so you're left with a hundred quite mad people, I suppose, who are still willing to stick it out to the end of the night and a similar small group of journalists who are covering whatever is happening. Um, Yeah, I've always hated that sort of thing. I think scheduling in tennis is, you know, there's been some crazy things going on and, you know, part of it's a symptom of longer matches and fitter players and, but there is also just a degree of poor planning. Probably the the first Davis Cup revamped by cosmos as it was at the time um was a really good example of just where they got that totally horribly wrong but they were trying to do six lots of matches over a day and it ended up every single night people were still there so that half three in the morning which you get away with a bit more in spain but um (laughs) you know most most countries where we don't have a siestas and then come back for dinner at nine o'clock it's a little bit unruly for me uh, just while I remember, speaking of Cosmos Davis Cup cock-ups, uh, I was trying to watch the Davis Cup draw uh, this week, which was they put on YouTube, which is very helpful to live stream the Davis Cup draw on YouTube. Anyone who regularly watches draws in any sport will know that it usually takes at least 20 minutes to get the first ball out because they know that's the only reason anyone's watching and they like to string it out. So we had about 15 minutes of um, chat and interviews. There was an interview with Cam Norrie, there was one with Ben Shelton, one with Yannick Sinner. And then they said, right, and now we're going to draw the first ball, and the YouTube stream died universally. And they took about five minutes to get it back up. I mean, it did eventually get back up, in fairness, but I did think it was kind of just typical typical what we've come to expect of Cosmos' Davis Cup. It, it is astonishing. It, draw ceremonies are one of the things that <laughs> really get my goat in tennis. They're all pretty awful to be honest um mm. and not very user friendly and it just always feels like such a thing that people you know if, if you're locked into the tennis twitterverse or whatever that's always something that people are really interested in and there's lots of engagement and everyone's excited to see who's going to play who and where and so often the actual draw itself is just rubbish i think i saw one recently where they it felt like they were filming it with a phone camera showing a massive draw on the side of a stadium but you couldn't see who the hell was actually being drawn so no one was any the wiser it's, it's it was just... miami i think wasn't it i saw Stu fraser tweeting about it and frustratedly um yeah just getting very very annoyed about it and quite completely reasonably so like obviously journalists we're always get annoyed about stuff that directly affects us but as you say that does directly affect fans um, since I mentioned the Davis Cup draw, I, I, I feel like we it sort of breezed past it. It's never appeared in one of your running orders, George. Um, so I'm going to blame you for that. Uh, Great, <laughs> Great Britain have drawn Australia, France and Switzerland, which once upon a time would have been an absolute blockbuster. Um, it, it might actually be, nevertheless, it's, it's in um, Coventry at the... Uh, oh God, George, what's the stadium called now? It was the Rico Arena last time I was there, but it's about eight... Oh God, it's got there. a really silly name now, but... Is it? Okay. Yeah. Well, it's the, the big stadium in Coventry with the casino in it has also got a very big indoor arena where the Group B matches are going to take place between Australia, Great Britain, France and Switzerland. Um, the real group of death is Spain, Serbia, Czech Republic and Korea, uh, which could pit Carlos Alcaraz against Novak Djokovic if we're very, very lucky. Although I think, that, I mean, even Rafa Nadal as well, but I think we might be um, wishful thinking there. It could be, George, Andy Murray's last ever Davis Cup adventure, do you think? Yeah, it's possible. I, I see him every year to say it could be Andy Murray's last this or that, and he's he's still kind of plodding on. But, yeah, I mean, I think there's got to be a point where you're questioning, is Murray the person you want playing for Britain? 
and you know we're pretty close to that point right now to be perfectly honest in terms of like actually picking him because he's the best person for the job I think you know if Draper's fit and playing well he feels like a really explosive option to be going to and Cam Norrie's been consistently in the top 20 um, recently and Evans has been a top 30 player now for the the past three years or so is Murray at that level you know he Mm. comes in for the doubles we have good doubles players we've spoken about that before that doesn't feel like an area you'd necessarily crowbar him in for the sake of it um so yeah it's I'm sure he will still play a little bit this year but unless there's some dramatic improvement in him the trajectory we're expecting for people like Draper I kind of find it quite difficult to see him lining up in any more singles matches for sure um, yeah, uh, 12th to the 17th of September this year, that'll be uh, in Coventry. The Group A was Canada, Italy, Sweden and Chile, which is quite tasty with a very strong Canada team. We've obviously got previous in Davis Cup and Italy have got some decent players in there as well. Yannick Sinner going well. Group D looks like the softest one, Croatia, Netherlands, USA and Finland, albeit some interesting players there with the resurgence of Borna Cioric, maybe Emil Rusevori. Talon Griekspor, I notice, is 16th in the race this year so far kind of subtly uh, in there. So, uh, yeah, we, we look forward to that coming to the UK. Um, you mentioned Andy Murray-George, or I made you mention him truthfully, and, and he does feature elsewhere on our running order this week uh, because he's joined IMG, which I don't think anyone really saw coming. I mean, I, you know, someone joining IMG is no surprise in tennis. They're a very powerful agency. Max Eisenberg delighted uh, to get Murray on board, of course. They're going to jointly manage uh, Murray's commercial dealings with Matt Gentry, who's been his agent for as long as anyone would care to remember, um, certainly for as long as I can remember. Um, I know there have been previous ones, but that was before I was a proper grown-up journalist, so it doesn't count. Um, it does, though, Calvin, sort of, I think, not worryingly, but it, it so Andy Murray has his own um, management agency that has a few footballers on their group books, which they've retained, and did have until last week, basically, a few tennis players as well as Murray himself, who they've not retained, and who they're going to help find other agents, but they are disbanding the tennis wing. I mean, for Britain's greatest ever tennis player to give up on managing, making money out of British tennis players, kind of just concerned me a little bit, to be honest, and surprised me. Um, I think it was always a kind of just a passion project that he had anyway. Um, I don't think it was ever something he really thought was going to make him a fortune um, in the, you know, it, I, I think it's different to the kind of thing what Federer and Osaka have set up, where I think they imagine that this will be their, this is still going to earn them vast amounts of money after. Um, yeah. And I think realistically, like, you know, Andy knows tennis players and, uh, you know, potentials and that kind of thing. And as I think I've discussed before, that because I have friends in that industry, that there just isn't loads of money in tennis unless you're looking at a top. 10 top 15 player Hmm. um you know and i know because because one of my best friends worked in that industry in a very good job and you know we speak about various tennis players and he just said you know for for what we're looking at i I don't think they're going to make anything like the kind of money that would interest us and that doesn't mean they can't make money but the agencies are only going to get 10 percent of the money that they get and as i've just said there you know with with the clothing deals even if you're 30 in the world, you might be getting something like £15,000 um, for a clothing deal for a year. $15,000, sorry. So then a big agency or somebody with who's already got a lot of money, do they want to be committing manpower and time to basically earn about £1,100 for the company? And there just isn't loads of money from that. They don't take... Um, agencies tend not to take a cut of prize money, so it's it's just commercial deals. And how many tennis players do we know? How many tennis players in the world are there that have high paying commercial deals at the minute? I'd say yeah, there's, I mean, it's... there's probably 10, 12. Yeah, I mean, obviously, it depends whether like what you consider high paying, but yeah, I mean, it's it's not it's not huge. It's the the, gr- the sort of gradient is very, very steep, yeah, you know, it goes from very, very little to a lot very quickly. And there's not kind of much. And this is part of the thing that the PTPA have kind of set out to try and solve is to fill in that gap a little bit. And I do note that they've signed an image rights deal, they reckon, this week. So um, I'm going to have to interrogate that more. But for a 
Blooming Players Union, their communications are shocking um, because they don't do any. So even people like me, whose job it is to find out what they do and who they should be spamming with emails every day telling me what they do, they don't. James.gray at inews.co.uk if you're listening, by the way. Wouldn't <laughs> mind the odd email off them. George? Yeah, I mean, it, it feels like that might... It would be interesting to see how it goes, and obviously, you know, that seems a fair enough endeavour to try and pursue, but I do struggle to see how they're going to make real headway with any of this unless they've got the biggest stars on in the sport on board to kind of collectively bargain you know half the problem is going to be is you know why would someone like Djokovic or Osaka or whoever else want to give up their kind of mega lucrative deals in exchange for a stronger kind of tour position I think it's just always a bit more complicated than they realize um when it comes down to it but yeah, there's certainly no harm trying to get more commercial money, but tennis really doesn't do a very good job of it selling itself either, um, which, you know, is something that could certainly improve in terms of getting eyes on the sport and more sponsor interest. And, you know, as it's all linked, isn't it? You know, television deals where you go off to Amazon for two years and no one sees you apart from the people who are already watching it and it's still hard to find. You know, that doesn't help. If you get things on terrestrial TV... That, that changes everything in terms of that sort of side of things. So, you know, there's a lot of short-termism that doesn't help the players and they're right to push back on that. But I don't really see how you can change that without kind of changing the entire ecosystem and model, um, which I think will be challenging for them to to uh, achieve, given there are so many stakeholders who uh, have their own agendas in mind. Uh, what do we think, just to drag us back onto topic briefly, if I may, um, what do we both think Andy Murray's post-tennis career choice will be? There's a fair few different things he could do, and I think that maybe this latest commercial move eliminates one of them. But, uh, George, you can go first. Uh, what do you think Andy Murray's... What When the tax man comes in five years' time and says, what's your occupation, what do you think he'll write down? <laughs> I do see a future where he gives coaching a go, whether that's in tennis or something else. I don't think I think that's a genuine option. He's, you know, we always say he's got a good brain for the sport, and there is a bit of a culture of hiring these super coaches. I mean, it'd be great if we could have a a period where Federer, Nadal, Djokovic, and Murray all return to coach. You know, be part of a coaching team of four kind of up and coming stars. That would be. You know, people would love that. That would get a lot of interest in the sport. And, you know, tennis, again, has to think about how it can keep these guys involved as long as possible. You know, it's always good to look at the future and stuff. But there is, in the modern day, huge cult followings around individuals. So having them cut off from your sport completely is not a good move, particularly. So I'm not saying the ATP will be encouraging young players to hire them. But, you know, they want to think about how they can keep these guys involved. And I think Murray, Murray's mentioned before, hasn't he? He'd be interested in kind of exploring that sort of route, I'm well, sure. Well, he said he so. wants to be a caddy at one point, which, mm. I mean, I thought was I thought was really interesting. It's kind of why I've said before that's why I like Andy Murray as a journalist, because he talks about random things and, like, he doesn't just say it, you know, like Nick Kyrgios says things just sort of randomly because they come into his head. He says them because he's thought about them and, and gives a long and interesting answer. But I don't think Andy Murray's going to be like a high-level caddy at any point. Um, I'm fairly but... sure uh, Wimbledon will pay him quite handsomely, or the BBC will pay him quite handsomely to come and be a pundit now and then. And he's, you know, obviously done the odd commentating stint. That, that's certainly one way to boost your bank balance quite quickly. I'm pretty sure he'd have a good, good bat yeah. there. Yeah, he probably should do some parenting at some point as well. I feel like he's yeah. been like on the road for a large chunk of his kids' lives. <laughs> um, Calvin, what do you think? What What do you see Andy Murray doing in five years' time? It's like a job interview question, isn't it? He'll probably dabble in all of them, I would think. Um, mm. I'd like to see him doing more commentary. I thought he was excellent when he did that. Um, he did that year at Wimbledon when he couldn't play, didn't he? Yeah. Um, I thought he was brilliant there. Um, as you know, as with all ex players, you know my thoughts on this with coaching. Just the old, uh, oh, I bet they'll be a good coach. They got a good brain. <laughs> is is like George just came up with there, classic trope, but uh, me, me, <laughs> meaningless doesn't mean anything because unless you know how to uh, communicate it, it's entirely irrelevant. And also the players 
who have good tennis brains it's it's a talent that they have they might not know how to explain it so they might do he might be an excellent coach i don't know but i just don't get this idea that seeing people saying oh you know we should get you know so and so should get federer in like based on what like what you know like who are look at the look at the best co football coaches in the world at the minute none of them were elite level players i guess guardiola was okay he wasn't an elite level player um, oh, I, I mean, I think Pep Guardiola was an elite. Wasn't what, player. what? Like, what was he ever in? A, he was never in a very good Barcelona team. He played, he played an all right Barcelona team. wasn't But he wasn't. What was he ever one of the top fifty players in the world? Uh, no, I think he might have been. I mean, nah, he wasn't. That Barca side won a lot. Like the one Conte the wasn't guy. bad either. Was Conte player. was all right. They're both all right players. Yeah, they I mean, weren't. Conte played in Juve's midfield. They weren't. All right, pretty, then. If, 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 elite, if, if all right, but okay. Let's let's say they were. I disagree. But let's say Pep Guardiola. What what would be the at the time he was playing? What would be Pep Guardiola's tennis player ranking? In in terms of football, I mean, that so that's very difficult because are you saying that you have to rank yourself in football and that ranking goes one to one from football into tennis? No, I'm saying what would the what would the comparison be? It wouldn't be it wouldn't be Roger Federer or Andy Murray. No, he was he no. wasn't one of the three or four best players in the world. And I no. think that that guys, let's say he was at one time the fiftieth best player in the world, for example. You know, those guys can make good coaches because they've had to think a lot more. The particularly talented people in any sport tend not to make great coaches because they don't know how they do what they do. It's just something that that comes to them. It's something that's natural. And unless you can express it, then it's irrelevant on a coaching situation. And all that, what you find a lot of them do as well, they, they end up getting frustrated themselves that the people who they're coaching can't do what they did. Yeah. So this is what people often say about Glenn Hoddle. Uh, yeah, he's the classic he the example. He's, he's one of the one of the best footballers of the, the 80s and, and I guess the early 90s as well. When he was like, when he was Chelsea player manager, I suppose. I mean, he wasn't really player manager; he was mostly just manager towards the end, anyway. And he'd be like, "Okay, we're going to do this drill. We take a touch in the center circle, turn, hit a forty-yard pass there, get the ball back, stick it in here, fine." And the players would all be like, "Well, we can't do that." And then Hoddle would do it because he was still at a level where he could. And and as you say, like, yeah, unfortunately, you don't need to have been a horse to be a good jockey, but. Equally, not good horses don't always make good jockeys. So, um, Right, off the break, we're actually going to talk about some tennis that's been happening because I believe Miami has been very busy. Welcome back to Tennis Unfiltered with me, James Gray of inews.co.uk and the iNewspaper. Tennis coach Calvin Beton is on one side of me. On the other is George Belshaw, uh, civil servant, occasional tennis player. And he claims a tennis writer, but Calvin doesn't believe him. Uh, we are a award-nominated podcast and with your help we can be an award-winning podcast if you head over to sportspodcastgroup.com or just google sports podcast awards and click best tennis podcast you can vote for us to win an award we never won an award before uh, well actually we did but we created and awarded the award to ourselves so it doesn't really count um there are lots of good tennis podcasts on there i'm a bit worried that people might discover tennis podcasts they haven't discovered before and leave us but if you could vote for us anyway before you go, that would be great. Please and thank you. Now, at long last, we're going to talk about Miami. After all that, uh, Daniil Medvedev's remarkable year continues with the title. Uh, I'm going to read you a list, George, and you're going to tell me what it is. Sydney, Winston-Salem, Tokyo, Sofia, Cincinnati, St. Petersburg, Shanghai, Paris, London, Marseille, Mallorca, Toronto, New York City, Los Cabos, Vienna, Rotterdam, Doha, Dubai, Miami. Is it A, my gap year? Is it B, everywhere Daniil Medvedev's won a title? Or is it C, Amanda Anasimova's holiday plans? <laughs> it, is, it is option B, James. Correct for £250. Well done, George. <laughs> Checks in the post. Uh, it's a pretty remarkable record. So he has now won 19 ATP singles titles all of them at different events. I mean, I, I wonder if anyone's ever done that. Hard to imagine that is the case. Not many players win 19 
titles in the first place. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's quite a good, point, good A good number of titles, but they're all to be different. Is yeah. It's one. a bit. It's a bit because I mean it's because of COVID, isn't it? And um, then he couldn't compete at certain tournaments last year. Then he got injured. It's. I think that's what it's basically about. His his good run started pre-COVID, didn't it? Uh, but even well, then, I don't like... Know. like I think it's pretty. I tell you what, I think it. I think it demonstrates like if we if I had said Daniil Medvedev's won nineteen titles and they've all, they've come at six events you know like he's won six places three or five places three times and won four times like would we not sit here and probably go oh you know he's in specific conditions he's very good but he's not a very rounded player so well, to, to flip it round does this not prove there's an all round i'm not no i'm not saying that it, i'm not criticizing him i'm saying mm. i think he would have won more at the same events i think he would have won all of those events mm. still but i think he'd have a few more like shanghai hasn't happened since he since he won it yeah, so, probably, yeah. um, so you know, and, and some of the other ones, like he had the, uh, he had the the injury last year. What he had, I think he'd have. I, I, th- I think were it not for COVID, and the injury and the war, he'd have probably about another seven or eight titles, and some of those mm. would be at the same places as the places he's won. Yeah, quite possibly. It's a heck of a list, though. I mean, I just, I mean, I suppose they're almost all hardcore. In fact, has he won? He hasn't won a clay court title, has he? Because they they must all be hard court. Um, yeah, he's won grass. Um, uh, which one of those is his grass court? Mallorca is his grass court title, yeah. right? Is that right? Yeah. Um, I mean, he's about. It's interesting, actually. You know, Did you remember they've had this amazing run so far, and he must be what is he third in the race, George? I'm not quite sure off the top of my head, but he's had a very good year. Needless to say, I'm checking. He's top in the race. In fact, he is now top in the race ahead of Djokovic and Alcaraz. Uh, so well done. I mean, without getting ahead of ourselves, but I just sort of thinking about Daniil Medvedev at Wimbledon. He was very good on the grass last year because he, he won Mallorca, obviously. He played in Haller, I think, and got a few decent results there. Did did he even play something like Rosmarlin or one of those? But he went very well on the grass. I mean, does anyone think that he might be a bit of a threat at Wimbledon this year? He... I would still back Djokovic at Wimbledon at the minute. I still think he's kind of the best grass quarter out there by a bit of a distance. But look, I mean, Medvedev has a good serve. He can play well on every surface. He's better than people think he is on clay. I think a lot of that's been kind of mental. He was fine going up to the quarterfinals in the French. I just don't, I don't see him winning the French Open because there'll be a big roadblock kind of in the way later in the tournament, but he could easily get to the semi-finals or possibly even the final these days. You know, the draws will open up. Things will be a bit random. Um, and over the next well, few years, to, people like Djokovic and Nadal go. He's up to four in the world now as well. And if he's still there, that will give him a very good draw. You know, that'll mean he'll... I mean, I suppose the problem well, is... Well, you Nadal, might get Mr. Rafael Nadal a bit earlier. Yeah, it's the time. problem you with Nadal know. being his classic sort of random floating seeding that you seem to get Ooh. every other year with Nadal. But, you know, you it means he avoids Djokovic and Alcaraz in the first, you know, five rounds, which is pretty valuable, realistically. Um, yeah. Yeah, you might get Nadal, but that's that's a one in 97 chance. And he'll, he'll have chances at the hard hardcore slams for the next four years but I still think he can add only if four are you writing off to deal with Medvedev at 31 no I just think Alcaraz will probably develop so much beyond that point that it's I think he'll just be better to be honest um, well, Alcaraz has got a forty percent improvement, hasn't he? According to his yeah, exactly. <laughs> and 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 we we did want to have him down to win fifty five Grand Slams, so there can't be many of a Medvedev left if, uh, if he's getting. All I can't those. remember. Given that we have to redi- revise that number down on a weekly basis, I don't know how many we're down to now. It must be down to about twenty five since we made that slightly bold prediction. Um, well, look, I got ahead of myself by talking about Daniil Medvedev on grass, and George, you rightly pulled me back to the clay because we are starting on clay this year. Calvin, Daniil Medvedev's game on clay, I mean, I know movement is such a big part of it, but the, the, from a tennis perspective, do you, do you think, I mean, there's no reason he shouldn't go reasonably on clay? No, nah, it'll be decent. I mean, the stuff about him not being good on clay comes from himself. He had that rant a couple of years ago, didn't he, where he <laughs> talked about how he hates clay courts. But yeah. he also claimed he despised the Indian Wells courts last, last week and made the final. 
So I wouldn't read anything into that. What did he make? Did he make quarters of French last year or semis? Yeah. Uh, last lost 16, a sister pass, I think. He, he made the oh, last no, no, year before, sorry. He was, yeah. he was injured on the last year. So. Quarterfinals 2021. And yeah. He made the last 16 in 2022. So, yeah, I mean, I, I'm trying to look at the... I mean, players he's beaten on clay, like... Shokovic. Oh, Roland Garros. Oh, right, not Roland Garros. Yeah. Not at Roland Garros, but he has he beat beaten him on clay. Beaten Monte Carlo, didn't Monte he? Monte Carlo, yeah. Uh, it, Roland Garros, Laszlo Gere, who's a good clay court player, and he beat him 3-4-3. and three. Mayamir Kekmanovic, who also knows how to play on clay. Um, Christian Garin, to be fair, who basically, you know, is a very... And he smashed him as well. So, yeah, he's got the results. And I guess one of the reasons we love to know Medvedev is because he talks so much total nonsense some of the time. So, probably can't take his own assessment of his clay court game uh, at face value. And he is a something like 62% winner on, on clay in his pro career. But he, I mean... I was just looking down his sort of tennis abstract on clay and he did go through a period where he didn't win a clay court match for two years. So he, he certainly has some previous for, for hating the surface. And in that, he also lost to Nick Kyrgios in Rome to and Pierre Huguez Herbert. Not players, I think, that Zanil Medvedev should really be losing to. I mean, Kyrgios on a hard court, maybe, but certainly uh, not on clay. Uh, he beat Yannick... Oh, sorry, George, before... before yeah, I was just going to say, I mean, I, I think the big question for Medvedev on both clay and grass is, can his level be so good to beat the very best two guys in the world, who are Alcaraz right. and Djokovic, and, you know, if Nadal's fit, is he going to reach that level? I suspect not, to be honest, this year. I think he's got a better chance of doing that on the grass um but yeah as i say he, i could see him easily being semi-finalist at both tournaments and i wouldn't be shocked if he went one further but yeah i just when push comes to shove i'd just always back people like Djokovic and alcaraz to win on those surfaces rather than him uh he beat yannick sinner in the final seven five 6-3, uh, Sinner, the number 10 seed who had knocked out Carlos Alcaraz. He said, leaving Miami tonight, feeling proud of what we achieved over the past month. It wasn't meant to be yesterday, but always improving and getting better. Now it's a few months off before the clay court season. It was a very tight match, to be fair, for the first 11 games. And then Sinner got broken in that 5-6 game and it kind of started to go away from him. Um, I, I think we've all, at various different times, been really big. Yannick Sinner fans and sort of being quite high on Yannick Sinner. Calvin, I think you probably started it and then maybe a bit of George. And I am now on the Yannick Sinner bandwagon. Um, that match against Carlos Alcaraz in the semi finals where he came from a set down, um, Alcaraz wasn't fully fit, I thought, in the last stages of the match. Definitely something going on with his leg. But there's a rally that I posted on Twitter that was just, I mean, ridic- I, 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 I just go and watch it. And then come back because I, I won't be able to do it justice. But both of them hit at least three distinctly Djokovician sort of defensive backhands, you know, uh, sort of defying physics with their knee and ankle ligament bend. Calvin, I don't know. I don't know if, if you will enjoy this because I know you don't like baseline slugging, but I wouldn't mind these guys playing 30 odd times over the next 10 years. No, I, I don't mind it. They're also quite different in how they play. Um, mm. but what my problem, it wasn't Djokovic and Nadal playing rallies like that. That was my problem. It was they just have long, long rallies where neither of them were doing much and everybody just rave about and go oh, like the level's unbelievable, which it was. Yeah. But I just don't really want to watch it all the time. Um, do you want I, to watch Alcaraz Cinema? Yeah. Time? Yeah. I, I stayed up and I watched that match. I've got to say not to cast aspersions, but I'm not convinced that there's anything wrong with Sinner. I think he's got a bit of that Nadal in him, where Nadal, as, as great a guy as he is and as brilliant a player... Wrong with Alcaraz, you mean? Yeah. Um, yeah, sorry, Alcaraz, yeah. In that he's... Nadal, him and, like, Nadal does this, where he never loses clean. He has to always <laughs> sort of make out there's some issue or, the you know, it's always... Some, I don't know whether it's to get in his opponent's head and try and put them off or for his own sake i don't think he'd have been feeling his leg if if he was winning that match put it that I way i can hear i can hear the dms and emails flying yeah. in for yeah. the nadal hate and i love it yeah, i yeah. love it <laughs> well you get them i don't so <laughs> enjoy those but no yeah it was a great it was a great match and and sinner is you know i think it's important that sinner won it because 
Sin is always the what the player who I think Alcaraz struggles with the most, but he's now beaten him a couple of times, I think two or three times in a row. And I think if we got to, if he'd have won that one, especially after Sinner was up in the first set with a break, I think then we'd have gone, oh, shit, right, we're now into the guy. The guy who he struggles with doesn't even give him any trouble now. But yeah. um, Sinner still, you know, does. He still strikes a huge ball. I'm interested to see how they develop. I mean, Alcaraz is the more complete player. There's no doubt about that. But um, Sinner's just, he's also still so skinny, isn't he? <laughs> yeah. You know, you look. Yeah. he just still looks like he's, like he still looks like he's about 17. Sinner needs to eat a bigger dinner, you might say. Yeah, um, but no, I agree. I think it's a more... Yeah, I'm going to let that hang in the air like no, the damp fart it was. <laughs> um, I think this is a really important kind of matchup starting to develop for tennis, to be honest. I've been really struggling to see who's going to be that person that can be an Alcaraz rival. I think just the big problem with Sinner is he's not, he's not really doing it against the other top guys, is he yet? It's quite often... I, I can't really I think, think of it many... Give some grief. I think he's one like... That's probably bad. I don't consider Sissipas the top guy. Is the... Who else um... is there? Just Medvedev. <laughs> Medvedev. I, I don't see him beating Djokovic very well. Like, I don't know. I, I just feel like he, he, he's missing that big big slam win over someone, yeah. isn't he? Sinner. Um, but if we, we can say get this that, match he, he, beat Zver- he beats Zverev. He's very early on in his career at a slam, didn't he? But then we used to yeah, not call that. We know that slam, doesn't. We know that doesn't mean anything. <laughs> Being yeah, very at a slam, yeah. it's it's a gate. It's like beating Derek Chisora in the heavyweight division. Yeah, it's true. Like, he he it's actually had the Nadal racket, the Nadal match on his racket the year he won it in the very damn yeah. French Open. Well, he played. As in, he, he was in. He was he in couldn't. the first set. He was in the first set, and then Nadal was he not two it. sets up on Djokovic at Wimbledon as well? Yeah, but then it was yeah. one of those. It was two sets up. Like, pulling his leg, isn't it? Yeah, then it was yeah, like six two, six two, six two, six two, or something. <laughs> I'm but just, he's a I'm good just... watch, mm. and Alcaraz is a good watch, and they they match up really well. And it's a match I'm actually looking forward to. Which you know, some of the other ones, I, I don't feel like we've had enough frequency of them to feel like there's a bit of a story growing. Whereas these two, I, I sense it's starting to really materialise. So I, I hope we get. I'd be quite pleased with a you know quarterfinal between them and the the French Open or something with the winner then going on to play Novak or something like that. That'd be quite a nice little sequence. I'm not sure if that actually can happen by ranking, James. I'm sure you can tell me. But uh, the quarterfinal not impossible. Uh, I mean unlikely, but possible. Um, the I'm just looking at Yannick Sinner's Grand Slam record against top twenty players, four and ten. So he beat Goffin. And uh, Zverev in the same French Open in 2020. That was the autumnal one. Um, and he beat Gael Monfils at the US Open two years ago. And he beat Alcaraz at Wimbledon last year, which again feels like it doesn't quite count. Um, but, I, you know, that uh, Alcaraz match at the US Open, you know, he served for the match in that, I think, in the third set. And then got absolutely tanned 7 love in the third set tiebreak. And it, oh, is that the other way around? Is that- the fourth set so was that... it. Fourth set breaker was it? Uh, he wasn't two sets to love up, was he? No, he wasn't. He was two sets to one up. That's right. Yeah, fourth. Um, set. Yeah, but anyway, that was obviously a very close match and a very late match. That's why my memory of it is blurry because it was like half three in the morning when it finished. It was wonderful, but I yeah, and uh, I I didn't need it at that point in the tournament, quite frankly. Um, but yes, do go and watch the highlights. I mean, it's, I don't often tell people to go and watch the highlights of matches because I think and this is like one of these things that we could talk about at length highlights of tennis matches just never never nearly as good just never Mm. makes like the odd rally you're like okay that's an amazing rally but so often points need the context of like everything that's gone on before but anyway that's that's neither here nor there um right moving on I think before I start waffling far too much um I was going to ask about Carlos Alcaraz's fitness. Calvin, you, you've already said you don't think he was that injured. But, George, do you believe he was injured? And if so, are we starting to see very early on some of the pitfalls of the tennis that Carlos Alcaraz plays? Like Nadal early on in his career. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't necessarily say it's quite the same same thing um, in terms of how they're kind of going about 
their tennis and like the impact etc going through the knees but I don't know it's always tough to say I, th I think you do just get it with it it's easy to forget how young this guy is and you know other people who are about his age are struggling with injuries Murray when he was about his age was struggling with injuries Djokovic I remember having a big shoulder problem probably around his age and was changing his serve etc like it's not that uncommon um for kind of young players to kind of a adapt if you like to the rigors of the tour um yeah i mean it's always hard to say how bad these things are isn't it like mm. we'll, we've seen him withdraw from things a bit more recently in terms of having like the ab in issue and a knee problem um he's generally out afterwards so i think you get a bit of a sense with him how bad it'll be or not versus how how quickly we see him next i'm fairly sure we'll see him lining up in monte carlo so probably yeah. gives you a bit of an indication of how bad it was he, he said afterwards that he was cramping and that he went to the toilet. He said, I went to the bathroom for like five minutes and then everything went down for me a little, little bit. So I wonder if the adrenaline might have um, spewed out of him a little there. Um, I want to bring up something kind of speaking of his press conference because I've got it in front of me. Um, people may have seen on, on Twitter, uh, Vanch, who I've mentioned before and is a, a good member of the tennis Twitter arty. A, a good member, as in like, I quite like his tweeting and we follow each other. So, you know, that's always nice. Um and someone posted a, a six-second clip of a question asked of, of Carlos Alcaraz. I've got the whole question in front of me because I think it's actually really important. And it was Craig Gabriel asking the question. Craig divides opinion. He's been around tennis for a long, long time. And I think playing the first half of his question and then having a go at him for that question is pretty unfair. So here's the whole question. Carlos, you have lost number one. You have lost the title. You have lost Sunshine Double. Does any one of those mean more to you that you have lost or the fact that you have lost a semi-final is all that really matters? Now, I don't know whether you guys even care about this, but I do, and I get annoyed when journalists get slammed without the full picture. Um, I think that question phrased the way it is is perfectly reasonable. It, when you just take the first half and say, and this is what the clip says, Carlos, you've lost number one, you've lost the title, you've lost Sunshine Double. Like, Of course, that sounds sort of like... I don't know. George, what do you think? Yeah, definitely. I've I've seen worse questions from him and from other people in the past. <laughs> so, um, yeah, not even in the top 10 worst questions Craig's asked. <laughs> and I've asked bad ones as well. So, you know. Well, yeah, yeah. And present company included, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think it's easier said than done. There are, these tournaments, they're quite long, they're quite stressful there's quite a lot of things going on and sometimes you get into a room and you're thinking, you know, in an ideal world, you might have spent a bit of time really thinking perfectly about the question. Sometimes you say things slightly wrong. I've had things before where I've asked people in questions in press conferences on, in the Zoom age and then it suddenly I wasn't allowed back in to kind of make a follow-up and the player's taking it really badly and something coming from somewhere else. I've had their agent getting in touch with me and saying, you know, what the hell was all this about? And you tried to explain, well, the moderator cut me off and I couldn't have a, an actual conversation with this person and kind of try and mm. explain it. Most, most people are kind of quite cordial, but you do get these things that are um, kind of misinterpreted and a bit harder. I mean, for what it's worth, you know, Craig, <laughs> Craig's reply on Twitter wasn't very nice either. And I, I no, hate no. that sort of thing where people are, you know, dismissive yeah. of others um who are trying to get involved and you know that's a bit of a yeah for, for a context, attitude then, you don't need but for context i think he said something like how many accredited tournaments how many tournaments have you been to and been accredited at i heard it's just one and that was because someone felt sorry for you which yeah i mean he's lashing out at that point and it, it was all pretty unsavory but i i just wanted to kind of and, and i really hate i hate this sort of fact that press conferences all go on um like youtube sort of unedited i mean i would rather they were unedited than edited i guess but like you know we don't go into there to have our questions broadcast if that makes sense like we go in there in order to get an answer that might fit into a piece you're writing or because we want to get you know a bit of emotion out of a player or, or try and get you know get them to speak in a certain way when I when I sit down and I ask someone a question, I'm not thinking how will this sound on broadcast because I'm not a broadcast journalist, I'm a print journalist. So when those press conferences then go on YouTube, I'm a bit like, well, I didn't really do that for someone to video it. And I appreciate that's just part of the course, but you know, I I don't love it, Calvin. 
yeah, I, I, this is the, a slight issue I have with this. Is I saw a few people saying that it would be terrible for Alcaraz's mental health that Craig asked that question, which is just bullshit. Carlos Alcaraz won't give a shit about that. And also, mm. it wasn't he? It was also just nonsense when he goes, "You've lost the sunshine double." Like, no, he's he won half of it. Like, <laughs> it's not like lost. It would mean you've lost both of them. Like, like he's, it's like, and also that's not really a thing. It's a thing that we've created. But yeah. I guarantee you that Carlos Alcaraz won't have given a shit about the way that that <laughs> question was worded. No, and and, and like uh, and like I said, like I think he's he's almost saying some people would say this. Does any of that bother you, or actually, you more, or are you more interested in winning or losing a semi final? Anyway, just one of those bees in my bonnet, and I'm well. Occasionally, I have to let the bee out, don't I? Uh, let's move on to the women's draw, where uh, it was another strong week for Eleni Rybakina, but she was beaten in the final by a blast from the past, Petrovitova, winning a title at the age of 33. Uh, it was a 30-point tiebreak to decide the first set, 16-14, and then 6-2 in the second set as the uh, the Rabakina ace count started to drop. Uh, Kvitova said she couldn't quite believe how well Rabakina was serving in that that first set and in the tiebreak, and she couldn't just she just couldn't get a racket on the ball. Um, but uh, yeah, she she did eventually triumph, as you say, George. As you you put the phrase in in the running order, blast from the past. Um, would you have expected Petra Kvitova to win this title? Or... She's always got to win one, hasn't she? Yeah, I'm, I'm possibly being a little bit harsh and different there, but it's felt to me a little bit in recent times like Kvitova was feeling like a, a little bit, and I mean this fairly tongue-in-cheek before anyone gets too upset, but a bit of a kind of a has-been who, you know, she'll still be fairly useful on the tour, but I didn't really see her winning many more big titles. And, and that was partly a compliment towards... Rybakina, Savalenka and Sviontek in the sense that it feels like there's this group of players who now are starting to take things really far forward. And we have, we've had, you know, we had Krichikova saying last week she felt she should be in the conversation. You know, if you'd have said to me Krichikova was going to win this title rather than Kvitova, um, I'd have found that more more believable, to be honest. But look, she's a, a brilliant player still. She's got lots of weapons um, and she's a, a nice person on the tour so I certainly have no no qualms there winning it and you know it's still a good week for Rybakina you know that's final here um, final in Indian Wells as well title so yeah I don't think I don't think she could be too unhappy and yeah, there's no harm getting you know because was back in the day was a, a fairly big big name so it doesn't it doesn't look terrible to the casual fan in terms of like a who's this nobody winning it it's still a good player who's done it and they're back in the top 10 so yeah would no you like thing. to take a stab at how many career titles Petra Kvitova has Oof. I'll open it to the floor I mean I would say she she has definitely gone through years where she's won a good number like somewhere between three and six I would say um maybe Correct. maybe higher um no so I, and I'd say there's been a few of those years so I'd say she's probably 20 titles maybe. She, that is her 30th career title 30th. pretty incredibly oh, yeah. 34 i mean she's she's actually just in terms of longevity and remember this is someone who had their wrist slashed by a home invader yeah. right like you know her career could have been over there and then she had to have surgery it was uh, you know not not to mention the mental kind of challenge of going through that and coming back to tennis she's won 30 titles if you take away the COVID year in 2020, when obviously half the season didn't happen, she only played seven tournaments. Other than that season, she's won at least one title every year since 2010. Uh, in 2011, she won six titles in total, which was her, her best ever year when she ended at uh, world number two. She's pretty impressive longevity, really, overall. Um, so, yeah, uh, George has written her off as a, a throwback and a has-been, but uh, when she wins Wimbledon for the second half, the third time, George, she's going to throw that in your face. She's going to walk into press, three-time Wimbledon champion, and go, George Belshaw wrote me off. Well, who's writing now, George? Not you, it's, according to Calvin um, Beton and Petra Kvitova. I'm merely here to give her the, uh, the motivation she needs to have that <laughs> glorious comeback so she can thank me when that happens. Well, if you're handing out motivation left, right and centre, George, can I recommend that you head round to Bianca Andrescu's house immediately? <laughs> Um, it, it happened just after our podcast last week, so it feels like a long time ago, but 
Um, we we were supposed to spend a long time talking up how well Bianca Andrescu had been playing, and we ended up running out of time. And it was slightly fortuitous because about three hours after we recorded it, um, she was playing against Alexandrova and went off in a wheelchair. Um, she tore has torn. She revealed on social media three ligaments in her ankle. Um, she was in tears. Her mum in the stands was in tears. She said it's the worst pain she's ever experienced. Um, you have to imagine that someone who's been through as many injuries as Bianca and Jessica knows a bit about pain. Um, I mean, Calvin, like, you'll have known players who've been through injuries and she's obviously been through more than most in her, even in her young career. And it, it looked innocuous at the time, but crikey, I mean, what a blow again. Yeah, um, it's difficult to tell with ankles um, how long they could be. It could be anywhere from sort of two or three weeks to four to six she's, months. She's torn three ligaments, though. Surely that's not going to be three weeks. No, but she said it wasn't. She said something like it's not as bad as I thought or something like that, didn't she, in a statement? Right? Yeah. Um, it won't be two or three weeks. No, no. <laughs> it's hard, hard to think how it could be worse unless, like, short of her foot falling off. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, no, no, you can go the other way. I've seen, you know, I've mentioned before that Michael Stick went, um, his foot went the other way, so his his leg went on the inside of his foot, and that oh, was a the year inversion. Out. Yeah. yeah. Um, whereas the one that um Andrescu's had, it's you know it's rolled, sprained ligaments, and that kind of thing. It's we saw his Verev, he had a pretty bad one, and he's he's only just coming back to form now. Mm. But they can feel terrible. I remember I, I've done it before, and I I remember I once was convinced I'd I'd broke my ankle. It was that bad, and it turned out once the it was the worst pain I've ever had, and I've dislocated kneecaps before. Um, and um, but then literally two weeks later, the swelling had gone down, and it was fine. So <laughs> it, it's difficult to even when you say ligament damage, it won't be two to three weeks, no, but it, it could be that she's playing again by the French Open. Um, um but it could be that it could be longer, yeah. I said three, it's only two ligaments. So, uh, results shown this is her statement results show that I've torn two ligaments in my left ankle. It's tough to say exactly how long it will take, but let's just say it could have been much worse. Um, you take it day by day. I'm optimistic the right work, rehab, and preparation. I'll be back on the court soon. Rehab process has already started and will continue to give updates. Love you all. P.S. George, please call me. I need your motivational techniques. Um, I, I think we'll, we'll have to make a vow to never. Um, say anything nice about Andrescu again because I feel every time we do it the week after something terrible happens uh, so I, yeah. I can only apologise uh, and that's I promise you if you come back I will never big you up again, again. <laughs> yeah if you're listening to future podcasts and you think we're not being nice enough about Bianca Andrescu this is why until she wins another slam we're not going to say anything well listen I mean if she's listening and I'm, I'm sure she isn't but best of luck uh, with the recovery because I think even though we sort of try and stay a little bit neutral, there are some players who are like, I just want you to be fit so that you can achieve your very obvious potential. And I think we all all think that Bianca Andreescu is one of them. Um, we're about to move into the clay season. Uh, I believe, in fact, it has already started in, well, Houston for one and Estoril for another in uh, Portugal. I would love to be in Estoril this week. That would maybe be my, my dream tournament for a number of reasons. Um what do we think the most interesting aspects of both tours are in this upcoming period? George, what's your sort of, what's your clay court story, your headline of the, your crystal ball? Uh, I, I think there's there's a few kind of on the men's side that are jumping out for me. I mean, yeah, but I did ask you for one. One. Well, I, suppose, I, suppose, I mean, the one for. The one for the men's that are most interested in is who's going to win the French Open, <laughs> which you know there's three it, it, players. That, that, that's a yes or no question, though, isn't it? Who's going to win the French Open? Yes, Nadal. No, Nadal. That's basically the question, right? Yeah, but then I think there's the, the Djokovic Alcaraz breakdown between that. I think that's the most interesting thing, really, to be honest. Like, who is is this Nadal done? Is Djokovic? really going to try and pull Alcaraz's pants down at this tournament? Is that match finally going to happen at, at a slam? And, you know, that's going to be quite big in the context of of the year. And, yeah, I think it's hard to kind of say right now who you'd, who you'd fancy for that at the French Open. I think that would be fantastic if we could get that match on the clay. Um, and obviously, if, if Rafa is fit and going as well, then 
that would be great news. Um, and I think the, the story is similar on the women's side, to be honest. You know, Sviomtek has got a bit of an injury at the minute. She feels like the comfortable favourite for me for the French Open. I think the other players maybe aren't as quite as strong in the clay, but has their mentality shifted that little bit since they've been having some success against her that they can do some damage there too, Rubakina and Sabalenka. And, you know, Krachikova, as we've mentioned before, she thinks she's up and about there. She is good on the clay and she has won the French Open in the past. So, yeah, I think just those kind of broad, quite basic questions, they both feel quite interesting fields coming into the French Open this year, which often isn't the case when you're just like, Nadal's going to turn up and just walk through this unless Djokovic comes up with an absolute madness. I am kind of interested in the women's side because, like, you know, we've had these two women who've been quite dominant this year. Um, well, three, I suppose, but I'm thinking specifically Sabalenka and Rybakina, who we think of as real hard quarters, right? Like, you know, big serves, powerful players, not people we associate with the clay court. I think Sabalenka's never been past the third round at Roland Garros. Rybakina, she obviously beat Serena in 2021, but that was the weird year when, like, Tamara Zidancek and Anastasia Pavlichenkova both made the semi-finals, and it was all a bit odd. Um, so I'm I'm sort of sceptical as to Rybakina's clay court credentials. And I kind of look at the top 20 in the women's side, I think... I don't know how many of these players I really think have a a lot of pedigree on the clay, Calvin. Like, I guess, like, Ostapenko obviously won a French Open, but that was a long time ago, and I, I don't think she's a natural clay court player per se. Sakari, I think, should be good on clay, but always seems to find a way to bottle it in big tournaments at the moment. I I don't know. I, I, I feel like just as we get into a period where I feel the top 20 of the women's is a bit more settled... We then go onto a surface when I think quite a lot of them don't fancy it. Uh, yeah, I don't think it's just one of those. I don't think the actual clay makes a whole lot of difference in with this current crop of women's players. Um, mm. I would still have Sabalenka, Rabakina, and um, and Svontek as as the main three, and that's the I'd I'd have the same favourites on all four of the slams. To be fair, I, they mm. wouldn't change. Um, but that's different from the men's. Mm. Yeah. I I, be, I I must I'll have to give it a couple of weeks, but I'm quite looking forward to trying to pull a couple of names out of my backside for the French Open because I feel like clay is a little bit more predictable. That there's more data that you can mess around with. Like grass is a total joke, but um, clay there's there's something to be done. Um, if, if you've got someone you're really expecting George to like pull something out in the clay court season or, or with something to prove i have one name in my head but uh who are you waiting to see something from that you've maybe not seen something from before well it's not that i've not seen something from them before we've spoken about them on this podcast already but i've got a bit of a feeling this might be a big one for sinner this clay court season i've just got a little bit i think he's actually quite quite well suited to the clay in some ways, and so you're picking the bloke who's just just made the final of a Masters event and is like nine in the world. Yeah, well, I'm, that. I'm, I'm tentatively picking him to end his duck of not winning a really um, big, without being stripped of context, Grand Slam match. So, <laughs> a very convoluted way of saying that. Right. Okay. Um, the name and Dominic I team, of course. Yeah, uh, yeah. How long? No, the name I had in my head was Lorenzo Mazzetti, because I feel like we used to talk about Lorenzo Mazzetti quite regularly, and then things have gone. I mean, he's beaten one top one hundred player in the last twelve months. Like, I don't, I don't know what's happened to Lorenzo Mazzetti, but it hasn't been good. Uh, and he's currently on a five match losing streak. He's playing Hugo Gaston in uh, Marrakesh, I think, tomorrow. Uh, in his first, well, it's not his first clay court tournament of the year, but it's his first one of the European clay court season. So what you're telling me is you're picking him to do well based on what you've just said. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, it's someone I want and I'm waiting to see something from. I'm told, um, I also... um, I'm told that Lorenzo Massetti, um, I don't know where to put this, he, he might be the male version of an Amanda Anisimova. Oh, no. 
I mean, when you. I mean, and that's it, it... that's not new. That's even I saw him around in juniors, and it, and there was a tendency to be that even then. I mean, in juniors, as Frew McMillan would say, he, he enjoyed a female companion. Right. I mean, he is the which makes him the total opposite of Yannick Sinner, right? Who's just a yeah. complete tennis nerd. But yeah. the, the guy that Alexander Bublik once said to, him, I think he was Bublik at the net, having been like trounced by him. He was like, "What are you doing, man? Like." I'd be having a beer if I was your age. And Yannick Sinner's like, what is this beer of which you speak? I don't understand. Um, I mean, I should point out, I love Yannick Sinner for that tennis nerdiness. But um, yeah. Uh, we move on to Marrakesh, to Houston, to Estoril and to Monte Carlo uh, this week. Please remember to vote for us in the Sports Podcast Awards. Um, for once, I'm doing my little wrap-up and George isn't looking at me expectantly or... Uh, with a, an any other business face so we're going to move on we're going to leave you there thank you very much for listening uh, do rate us review us vote for us follow us on twitter follow us on instagram follow us on facebook and most importantly come back next week <laughs>